All right. Good morning again. Um, that was a fantastic talk. Um, so now we're we're back again with um, with John, um, and he's going to be talking about um, sound event detection with machine learning. Um, hey, John, am I pronouncing your name right? Hey, yeah, that's great. All right, perfect. Um, so a little bit about um, about John. Um, he has been an engineer and and has like um, several years of experience with software uh, development, specifically around embedded systems and digital signal processing. Um, and these days, he's focusing uh, more specifically on machine learning for audio and Internet of Things. Um, so we're really psyched to see um, what you've got in store for us, man. And all the best. Thank you so much. So welcome, everyone. Today, I hope you enjoyed the session on uh, Auto Keras. That's uh, quite relevant uh, here, as we will also be building on uh, Keras. Um, so my name is Yoon Nirbe. I'm the head of uh, data science and machine learning at SoundSensing. SoundSensing is a company that focuses on audio and machine learning. And we provide easy to use IoT sensors that can continuously measure sound and use machine learning to extract interesting information. And information is provided presented in the online dashboard, and it's also available in an API for integrating with other systems. And uh, this technology is used for products around noise monitoring and condition monitoring of equipment. And today, we will be talking about sound event detection with machine learning in Python, of course. And uh, these uh, techniques can be used uh, with our tools or, of course, with any other tools, uh, and including completely open source solutions. So sound event detection is one of many common task formulations in machine learning. Some other examples are audio classifications and audio tagging, and these are illustrated on the screen. So in classification, you have an input audio, and then you are, uh, give out your model only produces one output, the class label. So for example, does it contain speech, or music, and so on. But it's a single choice. And um, However, in tagging, you allow the same clip to get multiple labels. So for example, it can, a clip might contain both speech and mouse clips and also keyboard typing if it is in an uh, office environment, for example. And in detection, which is what we will uh, talk about today, uh, you have a precise time information. So that's what separates detection from these other tasks. So uh, not just knowing that in this 10 seconds of audio, there is uh, these classes, but knowing exactly what times do we have the different events represented. So the task definition is uh, given an input audio, return the time steps, so the start and the end for each event class. Uh, and as a note, this task is also known as acoustic event detection or audio event detection, and these are all synonyms. So sometimes you see the SED, uh, acronym, and sometimes you see the AED acronym. So what are um, events? And, and when do you use event uh, detection versus classification? So uh, uh, in order for something to be an uh, event, uh, it needs to have a, a, at least a clear start, or uh, ideally also a clear uh, duration. So something that's start and stop. And it's somehow discrete, and you can, for example, uh, count them. So, so here are some examples of uh, modeling uh, sounds as events versus modeling them as classes. So say that you have a sensor system near a road. And um, if you uh, take in audio, say 10 seconds, uh, and in roads, a busy road, the, the sound of cars is nearly nearly constant. So, so you could model this as a classification problem. Uh, and then you would say that the class would be car traffic. If you would instead model this as an event problem, you want more detailed time-based information, then your, your, your class names might, or your event names might be, for example, car passing. So that's a single car passing, your, your sensor. Or a honk, so that's a single honk. And you have it like, speci uh, and in speech, for example, you could have a, like speech uh, as a class. You know, if I'm talking, that's speech as a, as a, as a class, like all, over time, continuously. Um, whereas an event representation in that domain would be a single word. So you would timestamp that single word. So it's important to, to think about your problem and whether you want uh, events or classes. 
uh, whenever you want to count something, uh, count discrete things, uh, then it's a good chance that it's an event problem. So uh, to make things uh, concrete today, we'll have an application, an example application. And we will be talking about uh, fermentation tracking when making alcoholic beverages, such as beer, cider, wine, et cetera. And try to make a, have a fun example that uh, some might also be interested in from, from other perspectives. So in um, alcohol uh, production or uh, making a nice uh, beverage, um, you make a uh, compound called uh, the, the wort, which is, contains yeast, some source of sugar, water, and maybe also additional flavorings and so on. And you put it all in a vessel. And this vessel is put in a location that has an appropriate uh, temperature. Um, and after some time, this will naturally um, start to ferment, or at least that's what you uh, hope. And during the fermentation, the yeast will eat up the sugar which is uh, the process that uh, produces alcohol. And as a byproduct, it also produces CO2 gas. Of course, uh, there are many things that can go wrong. The fermentation can fail to start. Maybe the yeast uh, is uh, dead or is uh, uh, struggling. Um, it can be also way too intense. So you can uh, get so much foaming that this uh, almost uh, doesn't explode, but it might create a lot of mess in, in, your, in your house. Um, or and sometimes the fermentation starts okay, but then it stops uh, for some uh, unknown reason abruptly, and you might need to restart it, for example. Uh, and so, as a brewer, you have to monitor this process, and that's what we will help the brewers do here. At the top of the vessel, uh, in this picture, you see a, a airlock, um, and uh, this is the device that will let the CO two produced out uh, while. Um, making sure that oxygen and also uh, bugs or dirt and so on cannot get into your brew. So it sounds uh, like this. So here you hear the CO2 being pushed through the airlock and it escapes out of the top. And as you can hear, this makes a characteristic sound, a plop for each bubble of gas that escapes. And this example has a nice and clear sound. It's not always so easy to pick up. And this is something that we can track using machine learning. We can have a microphone that picks up this sound, pass it through some software, and use a machine learning model to detect each individual plop, which you can then process further. So this is an example of events. Uh, it's clear, time-defined sounds that we want to count. And if you count these plops, you can estimate how much fermentation is going on. And you can also use it to estimate uh, the alcohol content uh, being produced. However, it's not a very precise method for it. But you can have a status that uh, tells you whether things are normal or not. So uh, if one would have such a system, uh, then you could uh, contract this over time. And the brewing uh, goes over fermentation. Primary fermentation happens over several days, usually. Um, and in the start, nothing uh, happens. Uh, then it starts to. Uh, ferment, and it usually reaches a peak relatively early. And then as the yeast has uh, eaten a lot of the sugars, uh, the uh, activity gradually goes down. So this is the kind of curves that you want to see. But of course, there are a lot of variations depending on what you have put in the brew, and also depending on the ambient temperature. And, and sometimes the there are, like, even with the same uh, settings and the same um, uh, input into the word, you might still have variations, but you want to see something like this, like no abrupt drop-offs and it should start within a reasonable time and so on. And if it doesn't, that's a, is something interesting to check out. So you might want to have a, a notification on your phone if there are anomalies, for example. Um, so our goal is to do this with um, sound, with sound event detection and machine learning. And of course, there are also dedicated uh, devices to this task, such as a Plato airlock. So that's a professional device, and that will uh, be a better solution. So if you just want to track your brewery, go buy something that is like battle tested. But here, this is a fun and interesting uh, problem uh, to do this with uh, sound, and it can make a practical uh, solution uh, as well. Um, so we will have a system that can track fermentation activity, and it will output a number of bubbles per minute. So how many? Uh, plops that we uh, heard. And uh, we'll do this by capturing the air sound with a microphone and then use machine learning to detect each plop. So that's our, that's our goal. 
so uh, when people say machine learning, many people mainly think about machine learning algorithms and code. But just as important, or in many cases, more important is the data. So without data, you don't have machine learning. There's nothing to learn from. Um, and you will not get a good model out, no matter how great your architecture is or your training process. Uh, you need good data for a good data machine learning model, and you need a good machine learning model for a good machine learning powered system. And the technique we are going to use, which is the most common for learning a classifier or detector, is what's called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, uh, you have labeled examples. So we will have input audio. And in the uh, training set, we will also have labeled uh, labels for this uh, of the expected output. So in this case, was it a bubble or a plop or not? And uh, there are many uh, several ways of um, labeling this um, data or formatting the, the la labels. And we will focus on what's called strongly labeled data. So this is a concept in, in sound event detection and also in other time series. So uh, with strongly labeled data, which is shown at the top uh, here, um, you have uh, precise annotations about each event type and each event that happens, the start and the end. So it's, uh, it's the same kind of output that we would want to uh, produce. This is all strongly labeled data. This is quite uh, uh, time intensive to produce, but it's the uh, once you have these uh, good labels, it's the most straightforward uh, um, uh, learning process and also how to evaluate and so on. So it's the, the best thing to start with. Invest in the data, and then you have the easier time uh, on. It's also possible to use weekly label data, but that's an advanced topic for, for another time. So when you have this uh, labeled uh, data set, uh, then you will put it into a training uh, process, and it the training process will spit out a um, model that now can act as a sound event detector for your specific uh, classes. And then that sound event detector can take an input audio and spit out the timestamped events uh, um, that we have in this audio. So um, important to consider is the requirements for your data. You need not just, not just any data, but you need uh, good data. And uh, one aspect is quantity. So you need to have enough data. And this varies a lot based on the complexity of the task. Um, but uh, this is like a, some rough guidelines. If you would have 100 events, uh, so instances per class, in this case, we only have one class. And um, then that's like the minimum level. If you, that's, you, need, you must be at least there. Otherwise, there's no point in starting the modeling part, you should focus on the data. Um, uh, with that, you would split this into a training and test set uh, per standard um, machine learning uses. So you might just have 30 events in your test set. So that's uh, quite little. If you would want to have 99% uh, accuracy or 1% error rate, then you wouldn't really be able to estimate that in, in such a small data set. And you will, it will be very noisy. Like your performance will seem to vary, but it's might actually just be, uh, for example, in your cross-validation, might just be statistical variation and not um, an actual significant uh, change. Uh, if you're a 1,000 um, instances per event, then you're, you're starting to, to get somewhere. Then you can have a couple of hundred events in the, in the test set, um, uh, which will give you better, um, more stable statistics. Um, if you have uh, 10,000 events or higher, that's in the very good range. So in the professional system, that's where you want to be. Uh, um, then you have very good, robust statistics, and, and uh, uh, you will have also significant amount of training data. So not just to validate, but also to learn a strong model on. But of course, uh, uh, quantity is not uh, all. You need to have the appropriate quality. And the most important uh, mindset here is that you need to have realistic uh, data. And then you have data that um, is from the relevant uh, is relevant to your task and also captures all the natural variation in this process. So when this comes out in, in production, um, your model has seen data that's very close to um, in the training process as it will in, in production. 
For example, there will be uh, variations in the event sound. So in our case, different airlock designs, so this mechanism creates different sounds. Different vessels, different sizes actually create different sounds and the material of the vessel in influences. Uh, different brews, so like um, uh, how intense the fermentation is, for example, is important. And this changes also over time. So each phase of the of the of a brew is slightly different. Um, and your recording device changes the sound. So it's not perfect. Uh, no matter how good a tool you use to record, uh, it's not going to be perfect. And also, your users, if you deploy this in a way that the users use their own devices, that will also have a lot of variations in the microphones, in the noise floor, um, maybe even program settings on what they are using. Um, so this is a source of, of, of variation which needs to be captured. Uh, otherwise, you will uh, create a system that seems to work okay uh, locally, but fails when it comes out in the field. Um, also, the recording environment. So uh, if if this is for home brewing, uh, then the environment uh, that this is in is often just like it might be a bathroom, it might be a kitchen, and it's used for other purposes too. So there are many other sounds, many other events, many other activities going on that will be background noise. And some of these might be very uh, rather easy to confuse um, uh, for a, a plop. Or some, uh, if you don't have uh, much variation at all, you could end up with a model that just looks at the uh, sound level effectively. And, and, and that could be fooled. Or that will uh, fail in many ways when, for example, someone just walks past. Um, so you need to capture um, background noise data that is uh, relevant for this task. And in an uncontrolled environment, this is potentially the space of all possible sounds. Um, so it, it can be, but you need to at least get the typical ones so that you would handle that. Um, so now that we we'll talk about data, uh, we can go on over and talk about the model. And this is uh, more the many talks talk mostly about this. Um, so here we're going to talk maybe 50 50. Um, it's important to understand the a general um, audio machine learning pipeline. And, and I've illustrated it here that com the start is uh, common to most uh, audio ML tasks. And then towards the end, we'll get more um, specific into um, our particular use case. So it starts with the audio uh, coming in. This can be stored audio clips, uh, or it can be a live stream from a microphone. And uh, this is uh, split into um, what's called analysis windows, which are fixed length uh, time windows. Um, and each window is uh, then uh, further processed independently of each other. Um, so from each time window, we compute some sort of feature representation. And a very common and effective feature representation is called a spectrogram. Uh, and um, this. Um, uh, is uh, time frequency based representation. So you have frequency along the y axis and time along uh, the x axis. And you can often visually see uh, the, the tasks you're interested in. And this um, is easy to understand as a human. And um, also, uh, we can use basically techniques from image uh, classification on this. Uh, so each um, Time window will go through the classifier and it will spit out the probability of an event occurring in this very small time section. So this will be a number between zero and one for each uh, class. Um, if you buy a classification, only one uh, output. And then uh, in our case, we will uh, put this um, together into what we call an event tracker, which will convert this into discrete uh, start and end times of uh, events. And then we will have this timeline of events. And then in our task, what we're actually interested in is not so much the individual events. That's actually uh, mostly a tool. What we are interested in is actually the bubbles per minute, the estimate of the uh, fermentation activity that we can plot over time and we can detect anomalies and so on. So that's the overview. And we'll have a look at a couple of the, uh, the steps here in, in detail. So spectrograms, um, I talked a bit uh, about them. They are very easy to extract uh, in Python. And one excellent tool for this is uh, Librosa. It also provides many other audio feature extraction tools. So definitely a, a uh, library to get familiar with if you're working in audio ML. 
Um, spectrograms um, like this is also implemented in PyTorch Audio and TensorFlow and so on. So it's uh, rather uh, accessible. Um, you often want to convert this to a uh, log uh, scaled spectrogram or a decibel representation. And this just compresses the numeric range and uh, makes it a little bit more in tune with, with uh, how we, we hear. And often we also use what's called a MEL spectrogram representation. Uh, which is um, uh, just a way of dividing up the frequency axis that is a little bit closer to our perceptual system, um, how we hear. Uh, but more importantly, it's a, it allows you to compress uh, the number of uh, bins that you need on the frequency axis, which is good for a machine learning model. Uh, and you will still keep all the, or most of the relevant information. Libra also provides uh, plotting tools, which are very nice. Oops. And uh, the classifier model can be can be many different uh, types of model in this framework, but a uh, very popular and powerful method would be to use a convolutional neural network. Um, and this is basically the type of network that you would use for an image-based problem. So in the spectrogram representation, we will have a two D, essentially an image, and uh, so this CNN is very suitable uh, for that and well known. Uh, to, to many. Uh, one difference to image models is that typically we will have um, a much uh, smaller model, or I would say fewer convolutional layers. So typical uh, sound event detection model might have two to five uh, layers. And, and you can do really, really well on even quite tricky tasks on uh, three layers of convolutional neural uh, network. So, so don't uh, go and put the biggest, uh, fattest model uh, in that you have, especially if you don't have so much data. So, um, because these tasks are often uh, compared to image processing, relatively uh, simple tasks, relatively simple patterns. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with the uh, deep learning, uh, you can also do um, a simple scikit learn model in, as an alternative, for example, a logistic regression. Uh, then it might be preferable to use not just a spectrogram and what's called MFCC representation. Uh, you'll find, if you search for this MFCC and audio, you'll find quite a lot of uh, information that. And that actually does well for many tasks. And I've tested it on this task, and it works uh, quite OK. Um, yes. So important, of course, is uh, performance evaluation. How do we know that our model is doing OK? And how do we measure this? So for sound event detection, a char typical characteristics is that we um, we have uh, imbalanced data. So we have a lot of background. So a lot of times, there's nothing is happening. For example, if the brew hasn't started yet, or even between each plop. So in early phases or in the late phases, it can be uh, several, many, many seconds between each plop. So most of our uh, analysis windows and in our instances to our model will be uh, false, will not have any event. Then a relatively small amount will have something happening. And then it's very important to not use accuracy, because accuracy um, would score very well even if you would just always guess the majority class. So much more relevant is to use uh, uh, the false positive rate or, or and false negative rate, or uh, what's called uh, precision and recall. And it's very useful to plot curves like this, um, uh, like a rock curve, uh, no, sorry, a trade-off curve. Um, and um, you can then compare different models on this. Because uh, sometimes you're interested in working in a high uh, precision regime. So you want to make sure that if the model outputs uh, that something is happening, it's very likely to be that. But other times, you might be OK with uh, be a little bit trigger happy, uh, as long as you capture uh, as many of them as possible. So you, there's a trade off here uh, possible. And you can choose the what's called operating point um, and then you can compare uh, different models. And you, you might want to yeah, compare them in the regime that you're interested in. Or you, if you were looking to, um, to see if something is always better, then you would compare it across the, across the entire range. Um, and you can also compare it with different conditions. So for example, the signal to noise ratio. How, how loud are your event sounds relative to the background? That's um, Something one can, for example, synthesize data around, or you might annotate it or calculate it. Um, and then you can look at, OK, how, how does this affect our performance? Because it, it very definitely will. 
And if it's important that the system works well in um, low, uh, high noise or low signal conditions, then you, you have to uh, do these tests and ensure that it doesn't just work when you have perfect laboratory condition audio, but also works when you have um, noise. Um, yeah, and you can do this evaluation based on each instance, uh, so each analysis window. Um, and uh, alternatively, you can also do it on the evaluation. And there's a tool called SED eval, Python library, that uh, can be useful for this. Um, the other component in our system is what we call the event tracker, which converts the continuous probabilities to a um, discrete list of events. And uh, it's, it's a very simple module. Um, and you just need to uh, threshold, so you need to decide OK, if it's above a certain uh, probability, then we will say, yes, this is, um, we think this is a uh, pop or an event. And then uh, if you are already in such an event, it's useful to have a different threshold to, to detect uh, when did this stop. Uh, and using different thresholds is useful because it avoids, uh, if you will have very uh, small variations around the threshold, this avoids the system going on, off, on, off all the time. And this is called uh, hysteresis, and it's common in, uh, in uh, process uh, control. And uh, the other component, uh, which is maybe not directly sound event detection, but something we're building on top, is this um, statistics estimator to compute the bubbles per minute. Um, and you could, you could report, you could count for one minute and just report that number, number of events that you detected um, as um, uh, as the, the, the BPM, the bubbles per minute. However, um, we our model, your model will always be uh, somewhat wrong. So you might have false positives. So you said it was a bubble and it was not. You must have false negatives. So you missed something. Um, and we have a process that we expect is very, very uh, periodic or, or regular. So uh, if we assume that, we can use uh, instead of, uh, of um, just counting, we can estimate um, the distance between each plop uh, and look at the, try to find a, um, the uh, typical value for this. And if you use the median, then you will be uh, robust against the uh, outliers. And this is expected to, to perform uh, uh, better uh, in real life conditions where you, you're gonna miss some events, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, for sure. And also you're gonna classify every uh, one minute and you can do this process with a little bit of overlap as well, maybe 10 seconds or so. So, uh, and each of those will give you different estimates. So you could again um, provide to, to average that um, uh, in order to give you this curve over time because one minute resolution is way more than you need. What you might be interested in is, for example, a value out per, per, uh, per hour, for example. I don't think any brewers want to check on their brew. Nothing will happen really in, in a few minutes. So. Uh, to warn once per uh, or on an hourly resolution might be uh, very, very good. So you can do multiple levels here and including in certain estimation. So, um, and now when you have that uh, part, then the, you might want to uh, present this to the user. And um, in this project, uh, which I'll link the GitHub to, to later, um, I found that there's uh, some established tracking solutions that brewers already use to plan their brewing and to track it over time with sensors. And one called Brewfather had a very nice uh, uh, API and super easy to integrate. So here's the all actually all the Python code uh, needed for for that. Um, and then when you uh, input into their system, uh, they can do it max uh, every 15 minutes. Uh, you can get this uh, graph over time, and then you can. Uh, um, at least visually check this, for example, once per day, you might have a look like, how is my, my brewing uh, doing there? How is it uh, going? Um, or if you're in the interesting phase, you might check it several uh, times per day from your, from your laptop or, uh, and so on. And you know uh, whether you should go and actually do something with your brew or if it's, uh, everything is good and you just let it sit and it will give you nice uh, beer in the end. So that's um, the parts that we had um, for uh, today. I have a couple of bonus ones that we might have uh, time for. Uh, but for more resources, I've published uh, the code for this uh, project. It's in an uh, early stage. Uh, there is some 
data there. There are some uh, Python notebooks that implement the basic model, but it's not yet the finished uh, solution by any chance. But it's a good place to, to have a look and follow if you're interested in, in this project and in the practical application of sound event detection. So that's on uh, Yonar Brewing Audio Event Detection. And I also provide some resources for general audio ML on, uh, also on GitHub, uh, the Yonar Machine Hearn Hearing Repository. And um, for this particular task, if you learned something now and you might want to learn more, there's a good uh, sound event detection paper by uh, Thomas Virtanen um, and uh, more called Sound Event Detection Editorial, which is really excellent. It's more of a, it's a it's very practically oriented, um, uh, but it's published as a as a engineering uh, paper. And I also did a presentation in EuroPython 2019 about audio classification with machine learning, and that talk will teach you a lot about, um, let's say, more of the basics. So if you felt now uh, um, that some of the things went a bit too fast around audio input representation and so on, check out that one. Um, or if you feel that this is all easy. I want to focus on optimization. I did a presentation at TinyML uh, this year. Um, the title is Environmental Noise with Microcontrollers, but it focuses a lot on how to make efficient models, so computationally efficient models, including ones that can run on a small sensor device like our own. So that's um, a good introduction in, in that talk. And uh, if you're interested in um, uh, machine learning on audio in general, I would encourage you to join the Sound of AI community, which is a Slack uh, uh, group. And it's very active. We have now around 3,000 uh, uh, participants. Um, and it's a great place to ask questions and connect with others that are interested in the same topic. So, an applause. Thank you. I have uh, just one uh, question I would like to ask the audience before they even ask uh, us is that the, think about what you want to make. So now you've learned about uh, audio event detection with machine learning. What are you interested in doing? You know, popcorn popping, birds, coughing, COVID detection, uh, drum hits from music, uh, car traffic, and so on. And all Many, many possibilities here. And I'm happy to discuss uh, particularities, questions, and also in the breakouts, of course. And yeah, consider to use, uh, if you want to production, make a professional system of this, consider to use the sound sensing uh, tools that we have. And we are also looking for, for people. So if you uh, want to make this your, uh, uh, your uh, favorite thing, then definitely uh, uh, contact us. We have full-time positions, freelance work, uh, internships, engineer thesis, and, uh, and partnerships. Thank you. Fantastic talk. I specifically love the fact that you covered the end-to-end -end journey from like you know one capturing the data to like you know actually showing how you can uh, mess around with it and um, and so on. I really loved it. Um, so thanks again for that. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure um, everyone who's who's listening would love to join your Slack community as well. Um, it seems like a pretty nice place to learn more about it and actually just um, to get their hands dirty with it. Um, so we um, we have a couple of questions. I'm just going to put them on on the screen, and uh, you know we can take them one by one if that's yeah, okay. Great. All right. So the first one is: How do you pick your um, spectrogram parameters and window length? Ah, this is a great uh, question. Um, if you have a task that someone else has done before, uh, or search around and see what others have tried, this is the best. So find try to find a paper, and uh, I mean. Try their parameters uh, first if they have relevant task. Um, in general, you can do good with uh, around um, 40, 50 milliseconds uh, uh, window. Uh, sorry, uh, frame length for a spectrogram, and the number of uh, uh, frequency bins might be 30 to 128. Um, and the window length that's what really depends on your task. It needs to be long enough to uh, to cover your event because uh, you need to see the entire event, in, at least the start of an event, in one go. So that's the most uh, task dependent. And you definitely try different things out there. Perfect. Um, and this is probably one of my personal questions as well. Um, what software tools can, can you use for like labeling audio data, especially when you have like a lot of data? Like how ah, are yes. you providing that? Yeah, I actually have a couple of slides on that. Will people still uh, see them? Uh, yeah, sure. I think we have um, time. We have uh, ten minutes, so we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can. You can just share your screen, and we can add you to add add it to the stream. 
Yeah, um, okay, there we are. All right. Uh, so I had, one second. Um, yes, I actually uh, skipped one slide. So uh, for manual labeling and also for verifying your data, uh, Audacity is a, is a great uh, tool. It's open source uh, tool. And here you can um, manually select the time uh, that the times that uh, are your events, and you would label them with true, for example. And you might want to select other things that are definitely not what you're interested in. You might label them with uh, false or, or, or no in this case. Um, and then you can export this as a CSV, and you can load it with pandas with a single uh, uh, frame. Um, so this is this is way to to start and really like dig into your code. If you want to do a lot of um, Sorry, the interior data. Uh, if you want to do a lot of um, uh, labels, this can be a quite slow process. So you can do semi-automatic labeling. Um, and one popular tool is called Gaussian Mixed Model, Hidden Markov Model is a mouthful, GMM, HMM. And this is unlabeled process. So it's not going to be perfect at detecting your events, but it will do, if you have a OK um, signal to noise ratio, it will do a pretty good job. You'll basically specify, I have two things in here, uh, some sort of uh, windows with background and windows with my events. And like, please like try to separate them. Like, I won't give you any information, but separate them. And uh, this is an output from actually uh, this, this task. And it does a really good job. It did only one mistake at the end. So you'll need to go over and quality assure this uh, uh, later. I hope that uh, answers that uh, question. Yeah, I, I I think it does, and um, um, I think the tool Audacity looks looks quite nice. I was just googling it um, on the site. Looks um, it's open source. Looks quite nice um, as well. Just to get started, and I was just looking at the at the chat. There are people already talking about building keystroke uh, <laughs> recognition models and 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 so on. Um, you know that a talk is successful when people are already talking about how they can apply. Yes, that's fantastic. Uh, that's what I want to talk about with the with <laughs> Yeah, um, there's there's actually one more question, um, which is, could we could we just compare the detected beats per minute? I'm assuming BPM is beats per minute to actual um, BPMs for model evaluation. Yes, in this case, it's bubbles per minute, which is a special oh, okay. <laughs> version right. of yeah. BPM, but um, it's the same thing. And yes, this is um, in, this is not a standard sound event detection evaluation, but that's the task that we are actually interested in. So. So I would encourage to do both, yeah, like do a evaluation of the classifier and also do a uh, BPM um, evaluation because in the end that's what we want, and that will also you should be able to do better on that task because you can tolerate a bit of errors. Um, um, right. Right. Yeah. I, I'm. I'm. Um. That that makes more sense. Yeah. Bubbles um per minute <laughs> makes more sense than like my uh, beats per minute. <laughs> Uh, but I think um, these were these were all the questions. And um, again, uh, thank you so much for the lovely talk. Um, I'm sure people would want you to be around. Um, so maybe you can head over to the breakout room of uh, uh, you know Parrot, and um, you all can have a quick chat about what are the use cases um, yes. you can do. I'm and, happy to uh, go in yeah. uh, Parrot, and then if someone is not able to join Parrot now but uh, want to talk later, uh, send me an email. Or join this uh, Sound of AI Slack community. I'm, I'm quite active there. You'll uh, you'll find me. Right. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>